and it's a good tree, bad tree. And I think we need to understand it. And and, and brackets, I have the power of the mind. So you have to understand this good tree, bad tree is going to go into the power of the mind. And we're going to walk into the place of of removing that place. So when you look at good tree, bad tree, maybe you want to put it in brackets just so nobody else knows, but we know that it's about the power of the mind. And it's a, it's a big place of, um, yeah, we're going to start the message already, so we're just going for it now. And um, <laughs> it basically, what, what good are we grabbing hold of and what bad are we grabbing hold of and how do we have to unroot the bad tree? How do we have to unroot the bad tree in our life? Now, we have to understand the, meta, the metaphor and the, the place of the bad tree that roots in. Anything that's negative in your life, anything that doesn't bear good fruit in your life is the bad tree that I'm talking about. So I'm not talking you're the bad tree, but I'm thinking that we're in an orchard and we, we ourselves are soil for God's word or soil for the enemy. And so where, what do we need to root out of our lives today to become thankful who we are in Christ Jesus? I'm putting thankful in there. And, um, <laughs> good job. Okay, yeah. <laughs> my thanksgiving message and we're just gonna have to be thankful in between while we preach okay and so when we root out the bad tree in our life how do we do that and how do we we create and the fruit of the good tree and so i think the biggest thing we have to know is that we, we have a hard time sometimes removing the two or they're entwined like if you look in a garden and you look at um <laughs> you know, i've seen in, in like it, whatever you see gardens that are just not good right <laughs> i won't say anybody's names and, and when those gardens are, or trees, even in my yard, like my grass and weeds are growing together terribly, like I'm ashamed of it. It's, but when they do, when you look at it, they entangle with each other. Even though there's good grass and there's bad weeds, they're, they're kind of wrapping around each other. And I think as a Christian, and as a Christian mind, it wraps around in us, and, and we, we have to try to unwrap that and remove the evil trees. So when you see a a tree farm and you see something something growing together even two trees that are growing together and that don't need to be together you have to be very careful to sever that so that the good tree stays alive or the good grass stays alive and i'm kind of a lazy person i just kill everything and then start all over again but don't do that in your life because you don't want to kill everything in your life that, that it works in the natural but it doesn't always work in the in, in the in our in our physical and so when i walk in my front yard and i try planting the grass this year and Someone gave me advice I shouldn't try it, but I said, I'm going to just try it anyway. <laughs> it worked good in the shade, but the, when it was hot, it didn't go well. And so when you walk in that place, and now you go back there in the front yard, and it looks green, but it's not green from grass. And so, <laughs> and, but then I, now I sprayed the weeds out of it and said, I maybe can salvage some grass and just seed again, but it looks now like brown and green. And so when you look at that in a Christian life, we, that's how sometimes we are in ourselves, and we look that way ourselves, where we come in a place where, where we're tw tangled up with some sinful nature or some past hurts or something, and we don't know how to unwind ourselves from that. And now we're stressing out, and we're, we don't know how to deal with these things. And I'm going to talk about how to, how to get the good tree going and how to remove the bad tree in our life. And we need to walk in that place. And I th it is called inner healing, just so you know. It is called the place where you have to remove and remove the root of the past. And people say, oh, I've done it so many times. But you know that um, we had a great time at Men of Honor yesterday. We had a nice small group, and it was a powerful word. And I'm, I'm going to speak that word again on, on Wednesday per, in, in a prophetic way, I think. But it's a really true that, is that when we have more revelation, the more abundance of revelation, the more thorns in the flesh we get. <laughs> the more abundance of revelation that was in Paul when he was talking about the thorn in the flesh. And he was talking about a place where he says, I am with abundance of revelations, and now the Satan, the messenger, is putting a thorn in my flesh. Well, they're not exactly in those words. I'm kind of twisting them around, but uh, if you read it, it means that. And he says, now the thorn, the messenger of Satan, is my flesh. So every time we walk in this place, we understand that every time we put something good out, the enemy tries to get in. He tries to put a thorn, and he tries to prick us, if you want to call it that, with a stick or something. Just poke us and bug us. But uh, the whole power of, of being extraordinary people is the grace that is efficient for us. And that we need to learn how to walk away from the power of the enemy more than ever because we are in that state of place. We need to learn how to be extraordinary people. I'm going to be talking about that on Wednesday a little bit as we do Moon Glory Night. Spontaneously, we're going to share that a little bit more. But it's really true that we need to walk in who we are called to be, but we have to somehow remove the thorn in our flesh. We have to remove the bad tree in our f flesh. We have to remove that place so that we can actually focus and flow in it. And the only way we can do it is by the grace of God. 
because the grace of God is what makes it efficient for us. And that's what the strength, that word strength in that scripture talks about this, the miracle working power within us, the miracle working God that is within us to remove these things from our life. How many know it is time to cheer up and move forward? Really. It is time to cheer up and move forward because what we're doing is that, is that we're, we don't want to become another ministry or a church that we just become here just and be sad here. We want to enjoy the presence of God. We want to enjoy our Father. We want to come into the fullness of Christ Jesus here. Amen? And we need to cheer up. And, and I'm not saying we're not all happy, but we need to cheer up. We need to be thankful. There we go again. We need to be thankful in the, what, in the presence of God. It's just a natural thing that flows in the Thanksgiving day. We just are thankful. Amen? And so, when you, when <laughs> yeah, and so pull hard today, and let me bring these scriptures for us really fast for you so you can go to have your turkey dinner, whatever you're having. Maybe you're having shalottos, or maybe you're having progies. I have no idea what you're having. But the, oh, whatever you're going out for, enjoy, enjoy your fellowship time, but let's really enjoy the food of Christ Jesus today. Let's really enjoy the word today. Let's just soak it in today and, and what, everything God has for us. Amen? Amen. And so Matthew... Um, 3, 9 to 12. But before verse 9, it's, it was talking about the Pharisees coming against John the Baptist, Baptizer, or whatever you want to call him, John the Baptist. <laughs> and um, the John the Baptizer, and uh, I'm, I'm George the Baptizer, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and power. Jesus Christ is here today. So, but anyway, when they, they were arguing, the Pharisees were coming against the fact that he was baptizing these people in the water of repentance. And he goes, and, and these Pharisees are there. I don't know if they're really arguing the point or they're just sitting there being critical. But they're there. And so John goes out and speaks to these people. And he speaks quite harshly to those people in, in that area. He speaks to those people. But anyway, let's just go on with it. But then he goes on and he explains himself. And, and when you have a critic in the crowd, you explain yourself. You, you start sharing God's word more because you hope to touch somebody's heart. And so these John the Baptizer, <laughs> I'm going to call him that, okay? John the Baptizer, he goes in that place where he starts sharing the truth of the word of God to the religious force, to the place that is judgmental, to the place that is going forth. And this is what he says in verse 9. He says, and I think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father. And I say to you that God is able to, of these stones to rise up the children of Abraham. He, he's going to the force that our God has power to rise up whatever it takes to rise up. And he's preferring back to Abraham. Why, does, why would John prefer back to Abraham for? Because everybody can relate to Abraham. Even the Pharisees can. So as soon as you say that you are of the Abraham seed, Pharisees are listening because they believe they are Abraham seed too. They're all listening to that because they're all connected to it now. And so what do we need to do is we need to grab a hold of the good in somebody to remove the bad. And so we have to come into the place where this person saw Abraham and he spoke about Abraham seed and everybody all of a sudden starts listening because everybody can connect to the Abraham seed. Because that was biblical and they studied it. They studied the Old Testament. That's what they followed. They were really sound-minded in those areas. And so here he goes and he says those things that our God is able to rise up these stones as children of, to Abraham. Like you, he's able to do all things. And so I would rather rise up myself than let a stone rise up. But I mean, <laughs> I would rather have us rise up in Christ Jesus than a stone, wouldn't you? So let's just, um, let's not let people use stones for worship. Let's, let's get ourselves in a place where God can use us instead of stones, right? You know, I don't know how God would use a stone except put in front of somebody to make him trip or something. But he, he would do, use it for some purpose for you to turn to God. And so let's look at this place, verse 10. It says, And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings forth good fruit, not good fruit, sorry, not good fruit, is hand down and cast into the fire. So here's a, God is saying, he's saying to them, so everything that we're doing here, if it's not good, it is cast into the fire. We are removing whatever is bad in our life. And laid down is to, to for God, by God himself, it's appointed to cut off the root and remove the bad in our life. To remove the bad in whatever's happening, in our religions, our homes, whatever it is. And it's held down, that means it's cut down. It is, it's, you cut off the association with the issue in life. So you're cutting off the association when you cut down something and burn it. So when we deal with inner healing or when we deal with the mind or when we deal with the negativity of somebody in our life and what we do is we cut it down and it's removed the association from that person so that root does not affect that person no more. 
And so now we need to get back to the good tree because we have to replace it. We have to allow the good tree to grow because the good tree in us, the one that bears good fruit, I'm going to talk about more because that is so important right now in today's day, in today's prophecy, in today's season, it is so important to grab a hold of the good tree. Why it's so important? Because the fruit, people are watching us and we need to bear good fruit and we need to remove every negative force in our life. Doesn't mean we'll never be negative. No, but we won't have the root of the negativity. So that when they look back, they won't see the negativity because the sin is covered now by the love of Jesus and they're not, they don't have a track record where to go. We are living in forgiveness daily so the enemy cannot see it. Do we make mistakes? Yeah, but the enemy cannot see it because he can only see the fruit. He can only see the bad. He can only see the track record. He can only see what you bear. So if you don't allow it to bear, he can't use it against you. Amen? So we walk into that place, and verse 11 says, I indeed baptize you with water of repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I. Those shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you in the, with the Holy Ghost and fire, and with fire. And so here we come in this place where he, first of all, talks about to remove the bad, and now he's going to replace the good, and the good tree is the power and the Holy Ghost power and fire in you. That's the good tree. So that's what needs to represent itself out of you. You need to represent the power and the anointing of Christ Jesus. You need to walk in the fullness. The one that came after him represented something because he just finished talking about removing the bad, cutting down the tree, and casting it into the fire, and now something better is coming. Something's planted more stable, which is Jesus Christ. Something that, is th that brings with the power and baptizes us with the Holy Ghost power and fire. And then he's going to walk in that place. He said, something better is coming that I'm not even worthy to bear in. But because of Jesus' death, we are worthy to walk in and to live in it. Amen? Amen. And so he says, the water of baptized of repentance, you know. And he says, I baptize people to change their mind to Christ Jesus. That's what repentance means. Change your mind. Change over it. Have an exchange in your life. Verse 12. Those fan, in the, <laughs> those fan is in the, his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. This is talking about a granary here. And I'll just, talk, I'll just read the whole verse. And gather his wheat into the granary, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. And so here he says, this guy, this Jesus, this person that is not, I'm not worthy to walk in the feet of, but he is worthy and he's going to come. And he's not going to come that you can replace Jesus, but he's bringing along the Holy Ghost. He's walking with the power of the Holy Ghost. He is coming to baptize you with something that you can walk with, something that you can live with, something that you can change your life with forever. I'm bringing you a good tree. I'm bringing you something that can bear good fruit. I'm bringing you something that's going to change your mind forever if you choose to walk in the fullness of the Holy Ghost. And so here he comes and he talks about it. He says, this person, this guy has a fan in his hand. And it, this fan is like a, a farmer that is trying to clean up floor ground for the grain to come in. And he's coming to, to clear the ground. He's removing the shaft from the grain. That's what this fan is talking about. It's blowing the shaft out of there. So when the grain falls, when the, uh, when the harvest comes in, when the goodness of God comes in, the shaft blows out while it's pouring down. The shaft is removing itself completely from your life. The shaft is the bad fruit he's talking, preferring to. The shaft is something that will interfere with the wheat if you don't remove it. So this fan, this God's hand is the fan. Blowing away your troubles. Blowing away the shaft of your life so he made room for you, the wheat to grow. He made room for prosperity. He made room for you to be healthy. He made room for that because he says if he did, he says he thoroughly purged his floor. This word thoroughly purge means to cleanse thoroughly your life. He's cleansing you. He's totally removing the issues of your life when you allow the wind of God to come in and you allow the fan of God to come in and it will start cleaning yourself up and it will thoroughly, not just a little bit, not just some, but thoroughly clean out your system in Christ Jesus and it will clean out the bad tree to bring out the good in you. It's the mind, the power of the mind that has to be removed. We have to choose to grab a hold, and we have to start seeing this way. You've got to imagine there might be a bad tree here. What, what am I doing? Well, how am I removing this bad tree that's in my life? Whatever it may be, whatever circumstance it may be, whatever fruit that is bearing that is not good and that's not of God, how am I removing that? Are you with me? Yeah? yeah? Am I just speaking to an empty crowd here? No? Okay, great. <laughs> Grabbing hold of the revelation, no knowledge. And then it says that, but he will burn up the shaft with the unquenchable fire. This unquenchable fire, it is preferring to eternal hell fire. It is preferring that. And it, it should, so just remember this. 
He's not talking that you're burning. He's talking about the shaft. The shaft is a sin that's going to go. The enemy, the demons in your life are going to burn in hellfire. He prepared it for them. He says he prepares this place for the, uh, Satan and his demons, the devil and his demons. He's going to he's repair this place for you. He says now the shaft is blowing into hellfire. Everything is going, vanishing away in your life. And it's removing, it's going back to sender. It's going back to the place where it doesn't have control over you no more. And it's going to be burned and be unquenchable fire. How many of you want your stuff and your negativity in your life just to burn away today? It's not talking about you going to hell right now. It's talking about you, the shaft blowing out of your life right now. Praise God that he doesn't always tell us about going hell, us going to hell. He talks about hell to remove us from hell. Amen? And he says, I'm blowing this shaft. I'm blowing this bad stuff out of your life so that you don't have to live in the everlasting life of hell. But you can walk in the fullness of love and you can bring forth the power of the Holy Ghost and you can live in the holiness of Jesus everywhere you walk and everywhere you talk, everywhere you sleep, wherever you, whatever you do. You drive your car, you can go start speaking in tongues, you can start worshiping God, and you will feel the presence of God wherever you're at. You choose to walk in the goodness of God today. The thankfulness of God, amen? <laughs> so then, after that scripture, of course, Jesus was baptized. Jesus was baptized, and the Holy Ghost came down on him as a, of a dove, and there it was released. The presence of the Holy Spirit was released that day for us. It was released, and Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost and power. And from that day forth, he went on and did many. He first went to the mountain, but after that, he did many, many things and many miracles when he was full of the Holy Ghost. He did many miracles. He had to have the Holy Ghost power. He had to have the fullness of Jesus Christ in him. He had the fullness of the Trinity power within him. He had to have that to walk in it. If people say that if he was God on this earth, and if he is God on this earth, that means he had to walk in the fullness of the Trinity of God. If you, you can't claim to be God if you don't take the fullness of God. You can't. That's why he had to walk in the fullness of God. If he was in the oneness of God, he was a Trinity. He was a power of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And he walked with the fullness of that because the Father spoke directly to him and released him fully into everything that he did. And today, God wants to release us into the goodness of, of his Holy Spirit. He wants to release us into the goodness of his tree right now. The good tree that bears good fruit in our life. People are going to trust you when they see good fruit. People are going to grab a hold of what you're doing. They're going to grab a hold. And I have seen it with some of you people here, that when you grab a hold of good fruit, and when there's something good happening in your life, guess what? People follow you, don't they? People start coming to the church, and they want to get healed like you did. Because that was good fruit. And when it's, once there's bad fruit, then the people come negative about a church or a person, don't they? All of a sudden, they say, huh, if you're being that negative, I don't know if I want to go there. But when you say there's something good happening, when there's good fruit, and you explain, and you testify, what God has done for you, all of a sudden everybody's changed. There's people in here that has one person that has come and has brought their whole families here because of the good fruit. Brought life changing to their families because of one person said, yes, that I'm going to get healed. The good fruit is something that changes our life forever. That's something that changes people's life around us forever. It changes people and it cannot be denied and people will walk that. And if they deny, they usually come back to it because they realize they were right. After all, that was good fruit. It was not bad fruit after all. They can usually see it. Amen. Give it the time because the fruit tastes good even if you don't agree with it. It's good fruit no matter which way you look at it. When somebody's healed, when somebody's delivered, when somebody's saved, it is good fruit no matter which way you look at it. When you see it, it tastes as good. People are fascinated with the healing power of God. People are fascinated with the work of God because it is good fruit. There's something good happened. And they watch and say, wow, I wish I could be healed. But it might not be of God. But wow, the fruit overrules the negativity usually. And people look at it and say, I want that what that person has. I want what that person has. I want more of Jesus like that person has. Might not be a God, but they always go back because it's tasty. Good fruit tastes as good. Amen? And so we're going to look at Matthew 7, 15 to 20. And just before this, he was talking about not to cast your holiness before the dogs. And he was, don't cast your pearls before the dogs. Don't cast that what God has given you. Just Don't just cast it away. Take care of what you have in Christ Jesus. Take care of that good fruit that you have. Don't just throw it here or there. If people are not going to eat it, it's just going to rot, right? So don't cast it to something that doesn't like it. Don't cast the fruit where people just go, I don't want it. I'm not even going to try it. My taste buds, I, don't, I probably won't like it. Give it a try! <laughs> but if they're not going to try it, make sure you take the fruit back. 
Because when the Bible says that if there's no peace, then take your peace with you. You can't leave the peace somewhere where it's not accepted. You have to walk in the presence of God, and you have to walk in the good fruit today. We have to choose to be in the place where we live and exude Christ Jesus everywhere we walk. But we have to remove the bad tree in our place. If we don't remove the bad tree in our life, it is going to hinder everything that we walk in. I guarantee it because there is nowhere in soil. Why would Jesus have so many parables about the ground being sold and, and represented to the kingdom of God? Kingdom of heaven is like this. Kingdom of heaven is like this. Everything about ground and farming and weeds and whatever else. He's, kingdom of heaven is like this. Remove it from the weeds. Put it in good ground, right? There's a reason why he said that because he says our, so, our soul is similar to soil. And if we put something bad and good together, they will entwine with each other. And they will grow together, and we're going to have to try to remove one or the other. And we're going to have, hopefully, we remove the negativity. But there's going to be something that we remove. Jesus knew that if we would choose Jesus, and we would take something in, it would entwine with what we do. And it would interfere with what we do. I just talked to somebody just recently, and I, they were just excited to hear this because I just said that we have a lot of good gifts up there, but most of it is filtered through negativity. It's, it's filtered through the bad tree. It's filtered through that place, and it represents itself differently because it, has to, it represents itself as a tree of good and evil joined together, and now the goodness of God is trying to come out, and it's filtered through that bad tree. It's filtered through the negativity. And when it's filtered through the negativity, that goodness comes out very wrongfully, hurtfully, condemning, whatever way it comes out, and we wonder, what's going on? I thought that was Jesus talking to me. In the meantime, we have to remove the negativity from our life. We have to remove the bad dream from our life to see the presence of God in our life completely. Amen? Are you okay with the Thanksgiving message? Yes. <laughs> then he also was talking about do unto the men as, like do unto other people as you would want to be treated. So if I want somebody to bless me, I need to be a blessing. If I want to to represent good fruit, uh, if to them to represent good fruit to me, I need to seed good fruit to them. And so it talks about that all before that. But let's just read verse 15 now of verse Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves, which means a robber. They're a robber. They're there to steal your joy. They're there to steal your victory. They're there to, they're to steal your healing. These are the people, just remember, beware of false prophets that come in sheep clothing. In most places, these are the people that are within the congregation or within the church setting because it's sheep. It's not a shepherd's clothing, it's in sheep's clothing. You have to understand these are people in the church that think they have a prophet or they think they are this place or they pretend to be this prophet and they actually pull the people away from the blessing of God within the church. And so when you look at the false prophet, it's not talking about a leader. It's talking about a sheep. It's talking about somebody that is being a wolf among the crowd. It's talking about somebody that's saying, I am holier than the pastor. You don't need to listen to the pastor. Listen to me. I know what God is saying. It's, it's those kind of people that pull it away and become raving because it becomes a self-centered prophecy. That's where I'm talking about where the goodness of God filters through that negativity and becomes falsehood because it doesn't sit right with people. Are you getting with this? Yeah? And so when he goes in there, it comes in sheep clothing, it becomes a robber, and these people come to steal the good fruit from your life. The good fruit of healing. I have seen it many, many times where people got healed and, and this person comes in and starts <laughs> raving about certain things <laughs> and starts talking about certain things. And all of a sudden, well, I guess I still have my headache after all. Hmm. I, maybe, I, maybe I didn't get healed. Well, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe, maybe I was just pretending or maybe it wasn't real. Maybe I raised my hands and it wasn't for God. Like all these things, that, these questions that come from these raving wolves that are, are claimed to be self-pointed prophets in a lot of cases or are often recognized as a godly person but are pulling things apart. And so we have to understand that they're there to rob your fruit. They're there to rob your joy. They're there to rob what God has called you to live in. What a false prophet is this. This is what you can study in Greek, what a false prophet relates to. is one who, acting the part of a divinely inspired prophet, utters falsehood under the name of divine prophecy. It's somebody that comes for a um, hidden agenda and uses his gift or his ability to come against and uses the divine ability that he has to come against people, to come against to get his way or to get their way. That's pretty, you know, that's pretty harsh. But that's what false prophets do. They, they're called false prophets because they're gifted and it's filtering through something that is self, selfish or that is bad tree. 
And so when you walk in, the two representatives. So you never have to be scared if there's good fruit. You never have to be scared if, if it doesn't tear you apart or make you doubt. You never have to be afraid of that. You have to walk in the fullness of trust in this. Wolves mean this. It comes as raving wolves. They come as crudely a destructive men in your life. It becomes a place. Uh, you see these kind of people often jumping up and forth and trying to find a place in so that they can just control the situation. The only thing, reason I'm, I thought I would add that verse into it is just because I think that verse was there for a reason. <laughs> and the next verse, it talks about fruit. This verse was there for a reason. This verse was there to warn us and saying that there's some age going to try to rob your good fruit from you. How many of you experienced God? If you experienced God, how many know, how many ever experienced somebody trying to rob that from you? Seriously, we have. You sure you're in the right place? You're sure that's your, your call? You're sure, you're sure, you're sure? All these little things that come against you, right? And so we have to walk in and say, yes! It was good fruit there. There's no reason why it shouldn't be there. There's a good track record. There's, there's things happening. God is doing great things in me. I shouldn't have to doubt that in my head. So we have to remove the bad tree from our life. We have to remove it from our head. We have to remove it from our mind, from our thinking, saying, well, well I don't know if I can receive from that person. He, I kind of know him from the past. Look at the fruit so that you can receive the fruit and eat of the fruit, whatever person it is in your life. So you have, we come into a place, and, and everybody here has somewhere down the line probably released some sort of bad fruit. Wouldn't you agree? Somewhere we've done something negative or done something wrong. And if people focus on that, 10 years ago you did that. Well, I see people doing that. There's critics right now uh, claiming on some evangelists and they're going back 10 years ago what happened. In the meantime, there's something great happening right now. Like, why are you not focused on the greatness of God right now? Why are you focused on 10 years ago? See, they focus on the fruit, and that's the only fruit they can grab. If it's 10 years ago, they'll focus on the 10-year bad fruit instead of the 10 years of good fruit. That is called a false prophet that does that. <laughs> That's so called somebody that is trying to be a raving wolf right there and trying to ruin a person in Christ Jesus. Amen? We have to walk in the fullness of God and we have to remove the negativity from our life today and know that when we do this, the enemy has no power over us because if we live in the place of repentance, it does never ever bear fruit. Amen? We can live almost perfect in Christ Jesus. What does perfect mean? Mature and full of power in Christ Jesus. We can live in perfectness. That's what perfect means in the Old Testament. Verse 17 says, verse 16 says this, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs <laughs> or thistles? <laughs> so we have to, you know them by their fruit. So what we do is that we, we will know, we will be acquainted by them. How do you know we're acquainted by people by what they do? So we either are connected because we're in the same situation as them or we're in the same negativity situation so we kind of have something that we are in common with them so we know them by their fruit, right? Or we can remove ourselves and we know something by the good fruit of God and we walk into that place. Now we have to choose because we've been involved in both. We have to choose somehow to divide the two and not focus on the negativity and the bad fruit. We have to focus on where God is leading us. And so what he says, do, do men gather thistles or uh, thorns or figs of thistles? So here's basically what I'm saying is that why are you looking for fruit where there is no fruit? You won't find th fruit and thorns. <laughs> you won't find th fruit and thistles. Like why are, you, why, are you, why are you pricking yourself constantly trying to look for something that's not there? <laughs> Listen, look into that scripture. Do you gather grapes and, of thorns or figs of thistles? <laughs> thistles? <laughs> really, are we going through our weeds trying to find something good? And that minute of goodness that you might find probably is not the right thing for you anyway. And those thistles. And so he says, are we looking in the wrong places for fruit? Are we looking in our negativity and trying to find something that we can build on when we should be looking on the positivity and looking at the fruit of God and building on that? And so what we do is we look at our circumstances and we look at this place and our root patterns pull us back to those negativities and we're building on the negativities and we're trying to grab fruit out of it and we're wondering, where are you, God? And when we are looking at our negativity, we're looking at that grudge that we had, we're looking at that argument, we're trying to get even and we think we've got to get even and then it's gonna, I'm going to feel better. No, you're not. I guarantee you won't feel better. You've seen it all over. If I could just get even with that person, I, I can't forgive them because then it would be like I'm letting them do it. You're going to be just as bad in the prison than that person is. <laughs> you have to remove it from your mind. You have to remove it from your place. And you have to choose to be in the presence of God in that place and say, I choose to look at the good tree. And I'm going to grab a hold of the good fruit in a person or in myself. 
So don't look for fruit where there is no fruit. We get caught with that, don't we? And just maybe somebody dropped something in here. Somewhere in the weed. <laughs> maybe there's something in there. <laughs> yeah, just, we just kind of have an excuse. Well, I think God made me sick, so I'm going to look for his... You only will find his glory when he brings you to victory. God only uses your sicknesses to bring things better in your life, not to bring things worse in your life. So we often look at those things, saying, where are you in this, God? I'm in your victory in that. <laughs> I'm in the good fruit of that, which is victory, and to be released in that. Amen? Verse 70 says, So, even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but the corrupt tree brings for, uh, forth evil fruit. This corrupt tree is this place of corruptness of a it's not longer fit for use. It's, it's, so this is not necessarily evil. This is just not even meant to be in your life no more. This is, you worked one time for you, but get rid of it. It's no good more. That tree is just not getting fruit no more. This is what it's talking about. This becomes a corrupt tree because you're focusing on something that worked for you 10 years ago, but that God doesn't want you for today. He wants you to remove something that you thought was still working for 10 years ago, and it's been came useless to you. It became worthless to you. Don't play on something that doesn't work for you. He's saying, start walking in me. Maybe it worked for you to have that or this or that. This corrupt tree means that something that is no longer fit for use or that is worn out. It's corrupt. What does corrupt mean? It might have been good at one time, but it became corrupt. It became in the wrong place. It became uh, idle maybe in your life or whatever it became. It became in the wrong place. And so it also means uh, poor quality or bad, unfit for use. It's worthless. So when we come into a place of walking in something and we're always walking into the past, we have to remove the bad tree and evil doesn't mean devil, just so you know, in this place. I'll share what evil means. We're trying to remove that bad tree from our life, but we don't want to let go of it because we have some good memories around that tree. But this, but that, but it doesn't work for me. It's worn out. You have to choose to change and be exchanged for his presence and move forward. In spite of how good it was, in spite of it. I often think back, if I just had a good, like I had that one day, I can't do that. Because that day's over. I have to choose to say God has something better for me this day because I am, if, if I have that fruit tree and if I have a good tree, that means there is some kind of increase happening here. That means there's something better coming up for me than me looking back there. Amen? So what does evil mean? He says, brings forth evil fruit. So if we look at the corrupt, if we focus on something that doesn't work for us or something that's worn out for us, this is what it does. It's full of hard labor. We become hardships. We become depressed. We become um, a place where a Christian has, loses his steadfastness. We forget how to hold fast because we're, we, we start thinking that that's not working for more. So we start thinking God doesn't work no more because we're not grabbing hold of that because we thought that was God and we, maybe it was God, but it's, not, it's not, not your path no more. You need to move on. And so we go back there, and, we, and this is what it means. It says, uh, a time of uh, Christian faith and steadfastness causing pain and trouble. It's a time where we start causing pain, and we cause trouble in our life. And we have to choose to say, okay, I'm not living in this evil time no more. What does evil mean? It means hardships in your life, something that's not from you, from God. It's something that we either enemy puts on ourselves and keeps on reminding us that fruit. We need to grab a hold of the good fruit. Amen? 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. This is the verse that Jesus himself is saying, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Whatever is done with, whatever is not good, it's just not good. Simple as that. You can't make something that is bad good in your life unless if you totally remove it and exchange it for good. And so when you look at that, a, a, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Jesus cannot bear bad fruit. His name, his authority, can never bad fruit. So you're always in the right place where Jesus is proclaimed. You're always. Because it cannot bear bad fruit. Where the Holy Spirit is released, you cannot bear bad fruit. You have to put that safety zone in saying, wow, I am so safe in the name of Jesus. That's why I am saved in Christ Jesus, because I'm safe in him. Now, you're going to listen to my message, uh, um, Safe from Destruction from Wednesday, if you're online. We, we are safe from destruction because of his name, because he only can bear good stuff. He cannot bear bad stuff. So we can actually renew our mind with Christ Jesus daily, and it actually can remove the negativity in our life, and remove the bad tree in our life, and actually be whole. And so when something negative comes against us, we live in repentance, and it has no fruit, so the enemy cannot use it against you. See, the thing is, uh, oh, we did something bad. Oh, no, not the enemies. No, that bad things do happen, but what are you doing with the bad things that happen? Repent 
exchange it right off the bat so there has no chance for fruit to grow. You don't have a problem. Amen? Every tree that brings good forth fruit is... Um, Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is thrown down, cut down, cast into the fire. And it says, by your fruits they will know you. By our fruits they will know us. It's by what we carry and by what we produce in Christ Jesus is why people know you. And so we live in this place and we live in this negativity sometimes and we do things that we shouldn't do because we're frustrated and we say, I don't care if everybody knows this. I'm just going to say it anyway. I'm just going to do this anyway. And it actually creates bad fruit in life. We've got to create good fruit in our life. We have to create this place, and we have to live in a place of forgiveness and repentance daily because people daily will do things that you don't agree with. Guaranteed. You might as well just overlook it. Say, I forgive them. I'm just going to bring the good fruit to them because the good fruit is going to bring an exchange to them eventually. Eventually, when they taste this stuff, it's going to do something for them. Amen? My last verse is Romans chapter. I'm doing really good today, by the way. I don't know. Amen? This is a good message, right? Come on. I know, I know it's Sunday morning, but it's still good, isn't it? Yeah, amen. See, the thing is that I'm very passionate about this because I think that if we can understand that the bad fruit is easier to remove than we think it is. The negativity in our life does not have to stay. It's not a, hard, it's not a stronghold in your life, only if you allow it to be a stronghold. It is easier to remove than you think it is. Because when it's removed... Don't let the trigger come back by the enemy lying to you that since you did something wrong, it's going to come back. Don't let him lie to you like that. And say, no, this, that fruit was calmed down. It was burnt down. It was demolished. It was totally brought into ashes, and the ashes became to beauty to us. Amen. Hallelujah. And then all of a sudden, the enemy says, well, what about that? Well, that tree doesn't even live no more. Why, why am I even thinking about an old tree that's not living no more? The fruit is burnt down. It is to the ground. The only thing is there is still the memory, and the enemy will work on that and the, the memory so that you will plant another tree like it. But when you live in this place and say, oh no, that enemy, I realize what I've done wrong. I realize what you're saying. And I say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, and I tell you to get out of my life. Or, in the name of Jesus, Lord, forgive me for what I did. And Lord, I, I live in repentance. I, I'm sorry, Lord. I forgive that person. And as soon as you do that, it has no room to have fruit. No room at all. Because you expel the seed instantly and replace it with a good fruit. Amen? Romans 12, 1 to 3. I beseech you, this is just before, it talks about the spiritual gifts. I beseech you, brothers, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you be present, but your, sorry, your, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is the reasonable service. We become a living sacrifice. You know what? Jesus is so good. Because he's not even telling me to die here. He's telling me to become alive here. You know, he's saying, become, he's saying, you're not good enough. He's not saying that. He says, you are so good that I want you to sacrifice and become alive. Sacrifice your sin. Sacrifice your sadness. Sacrifice everything that's not working for you and come to me and I'm going to give you a life and full of it. I love it because it says the word, I'm going to become a living sacrifice. That word living means to breathe among living, not lifeless, not dead at all, just alive in Christ Jesus. It means to be, enjoy real life. It means that you as Christians enjoy every moment, enjoy every cappuccino, enjoy every Coke that you like, enjoy everything you have. Do it in moderation. Don't get sick on it. <laughs> at the same time, I'm not saying that you should be unhealthy, but I'm saying he's saying enjoy life. What is enjoying? Enjoy your fellowship. Enjoy the people around you. Enjoy. I'm giving you the ability. I'm giving you the right to sacrifice for joy, to be happy in life. I'm giving you ready. I'm giving you a permission to be a sacrifice and everything that makes you sad right now. I'm giving you permission to come alive. I'm giving you permission to be life. I'm giving you, I'm giving you permission not to be lifeless. I'm giving permission to be alive. That's sacrifice. Hallelujah. We get to live. We get to live because there's good fruit in life. We get to enjoy it. Good fruit means you enjoy it. Good means pleasant. It means pleasure. It means it is good. It doesn't mean it's hardship. It doesn't mean it's, hmm, it's great. You can walk in it. You can enjoy it. You can have the presence of God in it. Why wouldn't you want to become a living sacrifice for Jesus? Everything in it is full of joy. Like We all know that because the things we don't do in Christ Jesus kind of hurts us, doesn't it? It eventually catches up to us, doesn't it? 
It just is not that good. So it is actually a privilege that we have that we don't have to become a dead sacrifice to Christ Jesus, but we can become a living sacrifice and become full of joy for him. And we can live in the fullness of joy. Amen? It also means to be active. It also means endless in the kingdom of God. We become endless in the kingdom of God. Endless in his blessing. Endless in everything he has for endless. Everything that he has is good fruit. Hmm, just delicious stuff for Christ Jesus today. We're getting rid of the old, and we're removing that from our mindset, and we're getting healed from the past, and we're cutting that bad root off, and we're throwing it in the fire, and we're choosing to live in joy today and enjoy life. So when you go out this door today, you can enjoy. Go, you can go to your family gatherings, whatever you have, and you can just go there full of joy, and you can actually joke around, you can have fun, and you know Christ Jesus is within you while you're doing that. It's not, like, we don't have to be so religious. I love it. I can just be me in Christ Jesus, and everywhere I go, I can be full of joy. Amen? If we can catch a hold of that, and we sometimes get caught by not, <laughs> um, not, not getting hold of that, absolutely. So when you go verse 2, it says, um, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed to the renewing of your mind. It's all about the mind. What are you going to renew today? Are you going to remove the old in your mind? And are you going to renew the living sacrifice of Christ Jesus in your mind that you can be full of life today? Are you going to sacrifice your mind for him so that you can be full of joy today? So that you can be full of peace today? So you can be full of blessing today? Are you going to sacrifice? And are you going to be able to and willing to renew your mind in Christ Jesus today and become a living sacrifice? Because that's where the good fruit is. That's where the good tree is. Amen? Confirmance of renewing of the mind, that you may be proved that, the, that what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How can you prove what is good in God? You have to renew your mind. You've got to connect to the good tree. You've got to connect to the fruit so that you can bear the fruit. Amen? Eat the fruit so you can bear the fruit. Amen. Verse 3 says, uh, For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think more highly about himself than he ought to think. Just so, you, just so you know, let's just read that again. You've got to listen real carefully here. Everybody looking at me? Everybody seeing? Okay. Here it says, For the grace is given to me, to every man that he among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Then you ought to think. It doesn't say you can't think highly about yourself. I am high in Christ Jesus. But I don't have to be who I'm not to be. But I can think of who I am and say, Jesus is in it 100%. I am in the high places of Christ Jesus. What about you? Don't think more highly than you ought to think. Because as soon as you think higher than you ought to think, you're thinking on somebody else's basis, not on God's basis. Think. Know that you're in the high places of Jesus Christ. Think on these things knowing that God appreciates you. Think highly of who you have within you. Think in those places. Amen? Sometimes we get so caught with that. But think soberly according to God who has dealt every man the measure of faith. Why can you still think good about yourself? It's because he's dealt a great measure of faith in you. He's dealt a measure of himself within you. Amen? So remember, this was preferring to, and then he was going to the DNA, which we all need to take again. So you guys should just sign up by, uh, by Thursday, and we should just have a blast. Like, seriously, you, that sacrifice of your time is going to be worth it. I guarantee it. And you're going to see the blessing of God flow because, you know what? It is time to equip in the goodness of God so that evil cannot overtake the Christians no more. It is time to know that when you become a living sacrifice and when you renew your mind in Christ Jesus and we burn the past, we let it go and the shaft blow into the, to the healing of God, and when we let that happen, we're going to be free indeed. Amen? And that you need help with. That's why there's church. That's why there's healing ministries. That's why there is that. But you need help with that. But allow. See, the thing is that if the tree is in you, and if you have the tree all tangled up in you here, and you're going to try doing it yourself, guess what? <laughs> you're tangled. You can't. How can you remove some evil from yourself when it's all tangled up in you? You need some delicate surgery sometimes, and sometimes you need some delicate help 
Because when I'm grown in goodness and God, and this mind is good, <laughs> and, but everything else around me is twisted around, or this spirit of God is good in me, and everything is twisted around, and I can't move. And every time I move, the evil comes with me. The bad tree flows with me. I have to have somebody to help me remove the evil tree. I have to get those roots out of my way because my hands are tied. Your soul is tied in the evil, in those emotions. Your soul is tied into to the hurts and abuse that person has been. Their soul is tied into it. That's why it's called soul ties. It is tied up. They can't remove it themselves. They're tied up. You have to remove the ties. You've got to let somebody untie it for you and just wind it out of your system. And while you do that, all of a sudden the tree becomes more alive. All of a sudden there's bearing more fruits because the goodness of God is shining more than the evil. Amen?